how to be faithful to God. How to be faithful to God. You know, uh, most of us, I think that'd be the prayer of our heart, isn't it? God, I want to be faithful to you no matter what. I want to stand before you one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. How to be faithful to God. Reading from Hebrews 4, first uh, three verses. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. And why didn't it profit them? Read it with me. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right? I'll read this. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They entered not in because of unbelief. How, how to be faithful to God. Heavenly Father, this is such a simple word. And yet, Lord, it's the simplicity of the word that keeps us living strong for you. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your presence tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for people that put your work in your house first. They didn't put television first tonight. They didn't put their family first. They didn't put their, their, their own desires first. They didn't go out to, to eat. They didn't go to the pleasure of this world. They've come here, Lord. And having come here, I pray you spread the table now. Put out the living word on the table. Lord, take my lips and sanctify the word that you put in my heart. Let it come forth freely. And Jesus, feed your people tonight. Encourage those who need to be encouraged. Lord, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the manna, the heavenly manna that you prepare for us every time we come. And Lord, we come hungry to your table right now. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in the preaching and in the hearing of the word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The writer of Hebrews also talked about being partakers of a heavenly calling. I, I don't know if you have tried to figure out what that means, that I'm a partaker of the heavenly calling. To me, it simply means that I hear a call that goes beyond this world. And I'm not called to this world, and this is not my home. I hear a call in my spirit. I, I hear a call. Uh, I had talked on the phone today to a young lady who's not been in this church for a year. She used to sit in the front with crutches. Uh, what's her name? Our Annette Garcia. Do I, does anybody know Annette Garcia in the church? She used to sit right up here in the front with crutches. She has, she has diabetes. And, and uh, <coughs> she, she uh, has had a terrible time with her health. And a number of months ago, uh, she... Uh, she had some kind of a pain in her leg, and they x-rayed and said it was okay. But a few weeks later, it, she had a fever, and she passed out and woke up in the hospital. And uh, she was out of it. They were giving her painkiller. She was in terrible pain in her leg. And they came, and she was half out of it because of, of the painkiller. And they made her sign. She said, they made me sign a paper. Her mother was there, and she thought everything was okay. And she said, this was today. She said, but when I woke up, I had no right leg. They cut my leg off. And they just they just took it. And I didn't know. I would have never allowed it. I would have really gone home and be with Jesus. They took the leg. And just recently, they want to take off the toes and the foot my other leg. And, uh, and she's on dialysis. And... A terrible, terrible physical condition. And uh, I, I'm going to, she's in uh, Yonkers Hospital. I'm, I'm going up there tomorrow morning to visit with her. I prayed with her this afternoon. And uh, she said, Pastor Dave, I've asked them to stop giving me dialysis. She said, they say I'll live maybe five days. And my family's telling me I'm doing the wrong thing. But she says, I don't feel at home here anymore. 
and I want to go be with Jesus. She said, and I want a body, words to the effect, I want a body with two legs. I said, honey, you're going to get your two legs, two arms, two feet, two eyes, two ears. You're going to have a body just like his. And we began to talk, and, and I almost got jealous of her going home in five days. I mean, she is going to, she is going to be out. I told her, I said, honey, you're, going to, you're not going to be here when your family has to face all the things that are coming. God's being merciful to you. She said, I know. She, and and she, she has a heavenly calling now. She's, been, she's called out. Of, this world has no meaning to her. And more and more I'm fighting in my life. That's what I want the Holy Ghost to bring me to, that I live every day as though it were my last day. Because every day could be your last day. You can go into the hospital and just suddenly be gone. I just heard another case. Somebody went in the hospital expecting to have time to get right with the Lord and immediately uh, didn't even come out of the first test, went into a coma, and within a day and a half was gone into eternity. That's why it's important to have this heavenly calling. To, to, to not be a partaker of the things of this world and not to be anchored that the Lord will start cutting all the strings that tie us down to this world. You know, we have Christians tied down to refrigerators and furniture and cars and, and apartments. And, and uh, young ladies are getting married. They say, oh, Jesus, don't come until I get married and enjoy my husband for a year or so. Then you can come. Folks, that may sound a little facetious, but it, that's not the heavenly calling. The heavenly calling is saying there's nothing in this world more important than my, my being in his presence. That's what Paul said. I would rather be with the Lord, but for your sakes I have to stay here. The heavenly calling, simply put, is that you hear heaven calling you. You hear heavenly heaven calling you. Have you ever said, Lord, uh, all I have is yours? You can have it all? How many have said that? Oh, do you mean it? I've said that so many times. But you see, just being loosed from the things of this world, just having all the cords cut, that is not faithfulness in itself. That's not what I mean by being faithful. Some people say, I really could be faithful if I, if I had no materialistic drive at all. There was nothing materialistic in me. I really believe that I could be faithful to God and I would be really pleasing to Him because I, I, I'm just not tied down to the world. Whereas the Bible said, even if you give your body to be burned at the stake and you didn't have love, it would, you, you would be dying and burning up in vain. Your, your martyrdom, your sacrifice of your physical body would have no meaning because you, you were not doing it God's way. You didn't have in your heart the charity and the love to people and to God that made it count. So when I talk about being faithful to the, to the Lord, it, it's not, well, if, if I could just spend more time reading my Bible... If I could have more quality time alone with the Lord, if I could just get over this one besetting sin that still has me in its grip, then I believe I could be called faithful to God and I would at least feel in my heart that God is pleased with me and we try so many, many ways to be faithful to God. We want to hear, you know, we hear about standing before Christ on the judgment seat. We don't want anything against us. We want to be able to say, Lord, uh, I bring to you a sacrifice. My body is a living sacrifice to you. Uh, but you say, wait a minute, Pastor Dave. Do you mean all my striving against sin, all of my sacrificing, and all of my efforts to cut away from materialism and covetousness and all these things, they don't matter? Yes, they do. A faithful person will do all of these things. But that's not faithfulness in itself. That does not describe, that's not the definition of faithfulness to God. There's only one way, according to the scripture, that we can completely be pleasing to God and be faithful to Him. And that's what I want to talk to you about now. Faithfulness is absolutely impossible unless it springs out of a trusting 
believing heart. You've heard it over and over again, without faith it's impossible to please God, but you haven't yet looked at that word impossible as you should. It's absolutely impossible. It's all things, all these other things I do because I'm faithful, they won't count unless it comes out of a trusting, believing heart in the Lord himself. You can't be faithful to God if you allow any encroachment of unbelief into your spirit. Any encroachment at all, at any time, allowing yourself, uh, not, I, I don't want to call it a luxury, allowing yourself to fall into a pit of despair and despondency and unbelief. All of this stuff stems from an unbelieving spirit, an unbelieving heart. It all comes out of that because of unbelief. The word preached to them didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it, the Scripture says. And here's where you have to read it. Lord, if it is not co-mixed with faith, every sermon you hear, every Scripture you read is in vain. Because it is, it is a letter that can absolutely kill because you do not have faith behind it. It has no value, the Scripture says. No value whatsoever with without being commingled or mixed with faith. My preaching tonight is not going to mean anything to you unless you mix it with faith. You sit here tonight and say, Lord Jesus, I want to understand and I want to know how to be faithful to you. Teach me tonight. And if you have that spirit of faith right now, God's going to speak, even though I may not be able to express it as good as I feel I should. The Holy Spirit's going to make it known to you. And when you walk out of here tonight, you're going to have settled deep in your heart what it means to be faithful to God. Who was faithful, the scripture says, speaking of Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Jesus was faithful, and Moses was faithful to the Heavenly Father. And how was it that God called them faithful? What were they doing that God says of them, Jesus, my son, is faithful to me. Moses, my servant, is faithful to me. The scripture says they held the beginning of their confidence in God steadfast to the end. They, they, they were able to say, truly, God, my father, is faithful in all things. They believed in the faithfulness of their heavenly father. They trusted completely in his mind and his will. God would make it known to them and they could fulfill it. And just as Jesus was faithful in his confidence with the Father, as Moses was faithful in his confidence with the Lord, this is also the measurement of our faithfulness to God. He measured his own son's faithfulness that way. He measured Moses' faithfulness by his trust in the Father. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. If. We, we are his house, we are his body, if we hold fast our confidence in him to the very end. And we don't falter, we don't give up on our faith. You know, uh, there's a tendency in all of us when trials begin to pile up, and prayers appear not to be answered. And difficulties come from all sides. You've heard me say many times in this pulpit, when problems and troubles and trials come, they come in pairs. And they come in quadruple. And sometimes they come just from every side. Trouble never comes once at a, one at a time. It doesn't come facing you. It comes this way, behind you, above you, around you. That's why the Bible says you're in the water, you're swimming for your life. There's a, there's a tendency when we get to that place to abandon our confidence in God. There's a tendency, we don't want to accuse God of not loving us. So what we do, and really it's a slap in God's face, we say, well, I guess... There's something wrong with me, or I don't have it all figured out. Or there's 
something wrong with my faith. I haven't figured faith out. But the bottom of all of that is a lack of confidence in God's faithfulness. It's a lack of confidence and nothing else. Now, the way the devil comes at us <clears throat> is through lies. Lies. You know the devil is a what? And he's the father of all lies. So every lie you hear is from the devil. Every lie you hear comes directly out of the pits of hell. The devil, the Bible said, was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John eight forty four. You've heard of, of the mother of all wars? Well, this is the mother of all lies, or the father of all lies, the Scripture says. God clearly warns his church that in the last days, the serpent is going to spend all his time accusing his brethren, the brethren, that's Christ's children, with a lying spirit. He's going to come against you with a barrage of lies. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The Bible said the devil cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. That's the church. That he might carry her away with the flood. And beloved, listen to me please. The devil is trying to sweep you absolutely away. To, to rob you of your faith and confidence in God. And he will come at you with a barrage of lies. Right out of the pit of hell. You can be worshiping the Lord in church and he'll try to attack you right in the house of God. He'll attack you on the street. He'll attack you when you lay down at night. You won't be able to sleep some nights because he will harass you. He injects into your very mind his lies. He speaks. He's a liar. The Bible says that he's going to come with a flood of lies. If you believe the word of God, believe this. I'll read it to you again. He will cast out of his mouth water like a flood after the woman or after the church that he might cause her, God's people, to be carried away with the flood. The flood of discouragement, the flood of fear that he causes by these manifold lies. <clears throat> this flood of lies has come, it comes mostly to disrupt your peace. See, God always ministers peace. The devil comes to minister fear. Fear is not of God, never was and never will be. The Bible says he's not given us a spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Now, who, who does he lie to? He doesn't lie to his children out in the street. He, he, he's already got them deceived. They have no faith. He's not after their faith because they have none. So who does the devil lie to? The Bible says after the woman, after the church, he goes after God's chosen people. And the more you want God, the hungry you are for the Lord Jesus, the more you, willing you are to lay aside the whole world, you become a target. You are the hot spot in his target. What do they call that dart in the middle of the target? Bullseye. You're the bullseye. Got it. Let, let me tell you that he is subtle and he's very convincing. And when, when you begin to pursue God's rest, the rest that I read to about here, where you say, Lord, I don't want to fear man. I don't want to fear in my life anymore. I want to live with peace in my heart. I want the joy of the Lord to be flooding in my soul. I don't want to have to be resting in my own works anymore to try to please God because I've tried so hard. I've tried to please God and I, I feel so many times that I failed Him. I feel so condemned sometimes and I feel so down. Well, folks, why are you feeling so condemned and down and fearful? Because you have already been listening to some of His lies. The lies of the enemy have already made an inroad, even though you're not aware of it, somewhere 
subconsciously these lies have been implanted in your spiritual mind. Hebrews 4 again. You still have Hebrews open? Go to verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that's entered into his rest, he is also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at me, please. Listen. I, I believe uh, Times Square Church people come here. I believe the devil has his demonic monitors center outside the door of this church. And I, I believe that the, all the all the principalities and powers of darkness, they are aware of your progress in God. They're aware of your hunger for God. Because you are moving further and further away from the kingdom of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of light, and you're preferring light now instead of the darkness. Even the battles you have, you're saying, I hate my sin, and the devil despises that, that you are learning to hate your sin. He sees your cry to be sanctified. He sees husbands starting to love their wives and be tender toward them. He sees wives beginning to submit to their husbands. And he sees things beginning to line up in your life according to the Scripture. And he sees you at home, not parked for hours in front of a television set, but you have your Bible out and you, you enrage the devil when you're sitting there not drinking in some incredible foolishness. But here you are with your Bible open. And I will tell you, he will come to you when your Bible is open. When you are sitting there uh, reading your Bible and praying, you're going to tell me he, he, he's not going to try to attack you and lie to you? Because he knows he has lost you. And he doesn't want to give up that easy. He will come. What does the Bible say? He comes as a roaring lion to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Doesn't say it's possible. It, it's possible if you just, if you will uh, believe these lies and give in to them. But that's why God sent the Holy Ghost. You see, the rest we're talking about, that's simply just a trust in God. It, it's no deep theological problem to figure out what rest is. It's saying, Lord, you've got everything under control. I really don't have anything to worry about. Lord, you promised that I'm not going to have to beg for bread. You said you're my heavenly father. You said you've numbered every hair in my head. You said you'll make a way where there is no way. You told me to go into the Word and look at the Old Testament, how you took care of three million Jews in the wilderness where there was there were no stores or no food stamps. There were nothing. And you took care of them. Lord, you told me that that's my example to believe, that, that you gave me examples all through it. Isn't that true? So, let me, let me talk to you about some of these lies that, that he brings into our life. His biggest lie of all is this. You ready? You are making no spiritual progress at all. You haven't learned anything. You're just as bad as you used to be. Anybody heard that one? He'll come to you and say, in spite of all your hunger for God and all of your self-denial, in spite of all of the ministry you've heard and all the sermons you've heard, you're making no progress in your Christian walk. You're still just as sinful. You've got a wooden head. You're still full of self. You've been given so much and you've heard so much. It's not changed you. You're not growing up spiritually. You'll never grow up if you live to be a hundred years old, he says. Mm -hmm. That's one of his biggest lies, and it, and, and it comes to many of us. He'll say something's wrong with you. You're not getting it. 
Everybody around you is growing. They're all passing you by. Just look around you. Everybody's happy but you. Everybody's getting their bills paid but you. Everybody's getting their prayers answered but you. You're sick and everybody else is healthy. What's wrong with you? He'll say, you're a phony. You're a hypocrite. You're weak. You're spineless. You're no good. Every one of those are lies. God doesn't talk to his children like that. The Holy Ghost doesn't talk like that. Another big lie. You are too weak for spiritual warfare. You're too weak. This spiritual warfare is too much for you. You are worn out. You are strung out. And you know what you do? You whisper, you are tired. You're weak. You're sick. You're dying. Lord, been, the devil's been trying to tell me that the last two years I'm dying. How many times the devil telling you you're dying? Every pain you get? Cancer. Cancer. I got cancer. I know it. It's cancer. Pain in your arm? A heart attack. I'm, I, I need a doctor and it's a heart attack. My arm fell asleep recently. It was tingling. It was from falling asleep. And I'm saying, uh-oh. And I honestly, I had three locks. And I went and unlocked the door so if I died, somebody wouldn't have to break the door down to find my body. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? You do the same thing. How many times he whispered to you, you're tired, you're worn out, this battle's too much for you? Why go on in spiritual warfare? Because you're not winning anything anyhow. Come on now. These are lies of the devil. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How does he wear you out? By lying insinuations. There are times that I've come in here, and if I had given in to those lies, I would have crawled to this pulpit feeling so tired. Much of our spiritual weariness is caused by this implanted lie, a constant stream of lies saying, you're wearing down, something's wrong, you're supposed to be at rest. And then the devil says, there's sin behind it. You say, Pastor Dave, you mean as pastor of this church, as one of the pastors of this church, the devil does that? He puts those kind of lies in your heart? Oh, yes. You think I'm Superman? My goodness, no pastor's Superman. They're <laughs> flies and blood just like everybody else. Amen, Sam? Amen. See, question, Satan will question your faith. That's all it's about. He questions your faith. He keeps questioning your faith. When you get sick, he'll just question you. Why are you sick? Where's the sin? Where's your faith? He'll question you every step of the way. Here's another vicious lie, terrible lie. God's not with you. You've grieved him away. God's not with you anymore. You've grieved him away. Oh, he still loves you, but he's not with you. There's something in you, unseen, unknown. His blessing is not on you right now. And you know what he'll do? The devil will take the scripture itself out of context and pound you with it. Try to pound your faith into the ground. He'll say, didn't God leave Israel when they sinned? Your present dry spell and your present struggle and your trials, all your troubles, isn't that proof that God's not with you? You're on your own. The Holy Ghost has left you. That has happened to so very, very many people. This was the lie that was planted by the devil in Gideon's mind. 
you know, Israel had been delivered out of the hands of the Midianites, and they were suffering cruelly at their hands, and God said to Gideon, The Lord's with you, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And a lie came into his mind, and he looked around at his circumstances. You know what he told God? He said, If the Lord is with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers talk about? saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, God did that simply to chase them, but God had come forward now saying, I want you to stand up in faith because I'm going to deliver you. I want to deliver you. I'm sure the devil tried to sell Moses on the lie that God was going to forsake Israel. Time and time again, the devil attacked Moses but God said Moses was faithful in all of his house. He never mistrusted me. No matter how black it seemed, no matter how dark and how hopeless it seemed, Moses held on to his confidence in me, the Lord says. Here's what happened. This, this is why Moses never doubted the Lord. He knew his merciful heart. He knew that God loved his children, that he would never forsake them. Listen, I want to share this with you before I close. It's so important for you to understand this. The thing that has blessed me and helped me more than anything in my life, and I go through some very difficult times too, I get my faith tested time and time again. But the one thing that keeps bringing me back is I am so convinced that God loves his people. God loves his children. He is passionately in love with his children and he cares. And then I, the, God, the Lord always says, look at yourself, David. Look at yourself. I just got a beautiful letter from one of my sons today. It just made me rejoice and weep inside. He just said, Dad, I'm so glad... I took him up on a mountain one time when he was seven years old. And I told him what God was going to do with him. The Lord had given me a vision. And I, I prophesied over all my children. And he said, thanks, Dad, for that mountaintop on your knee. And thank you for loving me enough to trust me into the hands of Jesus. And if I can have that kind of relationship with my sons, my children. My daughter, Bonnie, called me today. She was uh, trying to pull out of a, a supermarket. She's parked between two cars, and a pickup truck blocked her. And there was nobody around anywhere. This pickup just blocked her, couldn't get out. And this man was intent on evil. She just rolled up the window and bowed her head and began to cry out to God in mercy. And out of nowhere, God sent a car. And they sped off. And she talked to her today. She was just tre uh, trembling. And I felt the Father's heart. And I prayed, God. I prayed with her. I said, an angel of the Lord is with you, honey. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And here I am as an earthly father, feeling for her pain and her, even her fears and everything else. And he said, if you being earthly know how to do that, how much more your heavenly father? How much more? I always think of my love. Maybe some of you have not had a loving father and you can't relate to that. But he's an absolute loving father. And if you can trust his love... You can trust Him in everything. You can, you can be faithful in your confidence in Him because you know He's not mad at you. He may chasten you for a season, but He does that only because He said He loves you. And you say, well, I'm struggling with so much sin. I'm struggling with so many things. And you go through all these lies. God knows the devil's lying to you. And all He's saying, stand still now. Just stand still and see my salvation. Don't fret about it. Don't listen to it. I don't care what you're experiencing. I don't care what you're going through. 
He is here to embrace you tonight. And, and the Lord made it clear when I, I came to the pulpit tonight, even on the way here, he said, I, I, there are so many of my children, David, there are so many here tonight, just need the embrace of the Heavenly Father. They need to know that they're loved. And that's, I'm his shepherd, and he, he's told me to tell you that, that he cares about what you're going through. He sees every tear that you've shed. He knows what you're feeling right now and about all your family problems. That this precious little Annette that's at the hospital room right now uh, and, and beginning to go into death throes uh, because of the choice that she's made. Don't you know that Jesus is there as her nurse? He's nursing her. He's nursing you right now. He wants to nurse you right through it. You know, uh, it, it's a nurse who cares, not one of those uh, hard nurses. This is what jabs a needle. No, this is the one that tries to bathe away all the pain and the hurt. Are you going to trust him through what you're going through right now? Will you trust him and not accuse him of abandoning you, not accuse him of uh, not answering your prayers, not accuse him of anything, but just say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust you through this. I'm going to trust you through my battle. I'm going to trust you through my pain. I'm going to trust you through all my sicknesses and whatever may come upon me. I'm going to trust you. Hallelujah. Otherwise, folks, you get a hard heart. Every bit of unbelief leads, leads to a hard heart, and that's not God's plan. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Folks, this is such a simple word tonight. Very, very simple. Do you believe you're loved? I mean truly, wonderfully, marvelously loved by the Heavenly Father. And by Jesus, the Son of the living God, and by the Holy Ghost who abides in you. Is not your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. You know so? I've tried to preach you through the Holy Ghost into encouragement. And I see some of you tonight look so down. So downcast. Looks like you've got a 300 pound weight on your shoulder. I'm not going to look at you unless you think I'm picking you out. But I'll put my head down. But I know I have the mind of the Holy Spirit tonight. The devil has half the battle, half his battle against you won. If he can just get you to doubt the love of God for you and God's concern for you and care for you. And if he can convince you that God's mad at you, angry at you, then he's halfway won his battle. So, by an act of faith right now in this service, not some big emotional upheaval in your heart, but through a simple act of faith, say, Jesus, I accept your love. I know you care for me. And God, thank you for not being mad at me. Thank you for not being angry at me. Thank you for loving me. And then say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you to sanctify me. I'm going to trust. You know that's the work of the Holy Ghost. It's not your work. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't sanctify yourself. You can't purify yourself. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. If we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then you shall live. Through the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, thank you for coming and living in me. Jesus came to die for me, to provide salvation. The Holy Ghost was sent to see that it happens. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Father, forgive our unbelief. Take it away. Lord, you're not even rebuking us. You're, you're telling us in love that that unbelief will harden our hearts. Unbelief will cause us to bear so many burdens that we don't have to bear. And we go through so much turmoil that's unnecessary. Oh God, by your Spirit, lift this fear. I come against anxiety. I come against unbelief. And Lord, fear, despair, 
and all of these things that are pushed on us by the lies out of hell, we take your authority over them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you have, I have a special altar call tonight only for those who've been oppressed of the enemy. You've been oppressed by the devil. You have been a victim. You've been victimized by these lies of the enemy. And it's brought discouragement and it's brought some fear to your heart. Whatever it may be, you say, Brother Dave, that was for me because tonight I have to tell you the devil has been lying to me, trying to get me down and trying to rob me of, and shake my faith. Just, if he can just rattle your faith and shake it. That's what he tries to do. Come. Remember when those two disciples going to Emmaus, uh, Jesus came on them. They must have been so downcast. They must have been, they, they must have looked like they were dying or something. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? You know, I think that's why I'd, I'd, I'd want to say to so many of you up here, why are you so troubled? Why are you troubled? And and you would tell me, and you'd list all the reasons or something that's very, very strong and something very powerful that's happening in your life, something very shaking maybe, and you would tell me all that. But then I'd have to come back to you and say, no matter what it is, no matter what, if you were looking death right in the face like Annette is, God is going to be faithful. God's Word is true. Hallelujah. God's Word is true. Still not going to change His love for you. So why not believe Him right now with everything that's in you? Come like a child to His, to the foot of the throne and say, Jesus, tonight, I don't want unbelief to take a hold in me and grip me because Unbelief leads to hardness of heart. Did you hear me? Look at me. It's that serious. Unbelief will cause you to harden your heart against God. Why, God? I don't understand, God. And it's going to harden you. I know you don't want your heart hardened. You want your heart soft before the Lord. So ask God to forgive you of any kind of thought like that. And say, Jesus, whatever it is, I'm going to commit it to you right now. I resign from trying to figure it out. I resign and give it in your hands. Close your eyes right now. If you want to lift your hands to the Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I ask you to forgive my unbelief, all my doubting, all my questions. I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus, I know you love me. I know you see my faults. You see my failings, but I know you still love me. Forgive me, Jesus, and send the Holy Ghost to give me power to live for you, Jesus. Cleanse me of all sin and mostly of unbelief. I keep, I lay it at your feet. Jesus, help me to trust you in what I'm enduring, what I'm going through. I commit to you now, into your hands, to do what is right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful Savior. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you just sweep down upon us right now this Friday night right in the heart of New York City and Times Square, and bring a spirit of encouragement now. Lift up the spirits that are fallen down. Lift them up, Lord, every heart. I want you to just raise your hands and begin to love the Lord right now. Just raise your hands. Begin to worship Him. Say, Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're true. Say it to Him. Tell Him how faithful He is. Testify to it right now. Lord, you are faithful. You're not going to fail me, God. I'm not going to go around doubting you anymore. I'm not going to mistrust you. Lord, I put my confidence in you. Forgive my unbelief, O oh God. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful to you, Lord, in my confidence, holding fast my confidence to the end. Lord, you've not failed any of us. 
You have not failed any. Why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, and he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O oh God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me, let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction, bring forth an anointing. Let the word heal us this morning. Let the word strengthen us. Let the word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea. In, in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem and the inhabitants there and God's people. And he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming. And second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem, and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith, and this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> You're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people, and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing, where his fire fell on the altar, <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged, and there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them, where there would be bridges made so that they could... Uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. <clears throat> These battering rams are going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. 
they were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy, you're going to be humbled to the very dust, you're going to lay prostrate, and the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare, that the devil's going to come. You wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and hits, and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. You don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. He's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver his people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. That's what he has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, <clears throat> fine man of God, and just recently he was sued. And... Uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new. There's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we received uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messengers sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest. And she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fire, fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me, so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world, people going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord, and he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord, and he's going to carry you through. And one day, in his time, every enemy will be gone, and it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> he gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. 
what you're going through. Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says God will take over. <clears throat> you read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what, a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. The multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her malt and her munitions and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, the multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying, with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair. And everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you, and the dream will pass, and you will come into his glory. And you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had, and we have all the promises of the New Testament. <clears throat> yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He's warned us all <clears throat> that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, the closer you walk to Jesus, the hungry you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is, uh, send us the, the, this note. Dear brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. You know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance 
of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief. For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this he said, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your security. That you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed. I walk circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he... Bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment of, given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'll read something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being, what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 
30th chapter of Isaiah again. You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you and I will answer you. He said, I will deliver you and I'll handle all your enemies. But the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines. And they sent their ambassadors on swift horses. And they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Chapter 30. Uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to... Uh, Go to chapter 30, verse 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace. And that's going to be your strength. That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And, whether, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your bridle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. 
Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God, not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about distrusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up to me and say, Brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, the Lord touched me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial was raging around them, and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they've forgotten. And they're on the telephone. They're in panic. They're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded. He's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're down sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen worshiping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed. The posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel? When his own children, having all these promises, turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men. And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age in my 60s to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on his name and let him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God, not try to defend myself or the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago before I came to New York. You ever touched me? You came near me. You pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touch me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this.
but some of you are not there yet. You're still fading. Somebody talks about you on the job. Start a rumor. You go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through. Are you going to sit around? When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on His promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not of me. They've not asked it in my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this and that God told us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see their ambassadors and their princes? They've got swift horses and they're all excited. They're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just the swift. And you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that are after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over. You turn around, there it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And, you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down at it and he says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay. You don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no program, there's nothing on the face of the earth that's going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit, I resign. You do it. You do it. David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, 
Come on to me now and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it, but oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he will be very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. <clears throat> the first message. Uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligent I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that He alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to His name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said, and I use this very verse, you said when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness, and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And he's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you ashamed. And a reproach. You turn to the flesh, it ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. And when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity, and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction? Water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you are being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. 
Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. We'll never, won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still. Don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter, and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord, you take it from here. Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, You've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why He waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. And I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some have only been saved a year or two, maybe. You don't understand. It may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear. Guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling. And I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will. I will. I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. 
He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step, having committed everything to Him, casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack, You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out to your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God, this morning, give you a great victory. That He'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here that came forward. Holy Spirit just spoke something in my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel led the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately the enemies even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. You might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning that will never come again. <laughs> Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. And it reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of his shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against every principality and power of darkness.